eats its prey. It's often the same size or larger. Um, so, um, and, and those are the ones that people are most familiar with, ladybug, lacewing, um, either adult or uh, larval face. It's lots and lots and lots of stuff. And mostly they eat the things that you don't want. Um, parasitoid. Um, I have lots of pictures, and there's pictures in the handout to some of these little guys. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of native um, wasps um, in that family that uh, lay their eggs inside caterpillars and aphid in particular. That's a, a favorite candy of theirs. And uh, they let the larva hatch out, consume the inside of the insect, and then hatch out. Um, there's, a, there's a lovely picture I'll show point you to it. Um, second page, bottom right. So that's a parasitic wasp, and that's what it looks like. And I was um, walking with someone through their field, and I was looking at the aphid, and I was looking for signs. You really, the parasitic wasps are often tiny. Yeah. Um, there's one for common mock larva, Trichogramma. They don't have it up here, but they use it a lot in California. Can it survive? No. No. Um, my friend um, <coughs> Jan down at my Larva in Ventura, she has worked with UC for a long time trying to breed hardier uh, strains and they just can't get it much north of They're using them in walnut orchards um, in uh, Chico area, but that's about as far north as they've been able to do is, is in the Sacramento Valley. Can they actually control aphids with the wasps? Because aphids, you know, yes. they, yeah, that, yeah. they lay a lot of eggs. <laughs> they lay a lot of eggs. And so I was thinking... But it has to be that kind of wasp? Um, there are others, Brachinids, there's a number of them. Um, some that breed that commercial. Beautiful paper oh, no. Those, yeah, really? those guys are more predators. Those call bastards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same. It's the same. Yeah. Right. Bastards. They, they eat their. Yeah, yeah they're just more eat predatory. Yeah, they're yeah. Just yeah. Just so predatory. regular wasps, do you call them that? But they actually do something, so I don't yeah, know. Exactly. There's a lot. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know that they just need to be where they're supposed to be. That's the thing, and that's what that's what I'm trying to talk about in this particular workshop is um, they're only a bad guy if they're doing what we don't want them to do. Well, um, come to your dinner when you're on the patio. I right. Mean, they all swarmed enough to get you off the patio. So. Sting you while you're butchering an animal. Oh. Um, <laughs> the last, like the small you're butchering it too much. They love it. Uh -huh. Yeah. They yeah. want to be on it. So a lot of times I just don't do what I know makes them healthy stuff. Yeah. And um, or I do the things that attract the guys I do want. Um, so um, there was only one year that I had trouble with um, with yellow jackets. And uh, I just put out traps with little tasty treats for them. And, um, yeah, and I've also had trouble with them getting into my beehives as well. And just have to really monitor and make sure that I do a lot of trapping in and around the area where they're flying. And I also found out that um, they like to set trap along the ground. So rather than mm. hanging traps in the eaves of the buildings, I was putting them down around the corners of the building. Hmm. And that helped. And I would see them just like scent tracking along the ground. And I cut a lot more. Well, we have drought. And um, we have to water everything. Six yes. Six or five days to open up. Yeah. And I noticed along the hose line where there's water, they're mm -hmm. always attracted yes. right there. So wherever, like especially when dry, Absolutely. They're, they're right there where water is. So you might be able to put something up farther away and have them be over there. Pull it away from that area. That Even like at dripping pad or something. Because right. they just love it. Right. Yeah, I'm on drip um, everywhere. And, um, and when I go to turn on the irrigation, there'll be one at every single emitter. So what I tend to do is um, I want to work in the garden in the morning when it's cool. Yeah. So I don't start the irrigation cycle till I'm done yeah. with garden chores. And then I'm not having to like look at every single window. Wasps, wasps don't fly wasps. at night. They don't. They don't. Um, I've tried gardening by headlamp. Uh, full moon, I can do that. Um, a little hard. <laughs> no, I was just saying if you watered in the evening. 
Yes, and overnight is less evaporation as well. Right, but yeah, I just don't know why. Are part of good pollinators? They are. Yeah, well, not, that's why they need to not be at all killed. Yes. Because even in Spokane, a lot of people are really into killing them all. But yeah, I, 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 I kind of believe that we just need to channel them in other places. I do know not like them to come to my dinner, but you know, maybe you have dinner at a time they Where well, do they need to go is what none of us know. That's is the, the thing is <laughs> so, 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 so long I'll just yeah. jump ahead. There's a couple of uh, families of plants that I plant a whole lot of and lots of different types. And the legumes. <laughs> what? Because legumes, Legume. okay. so pean bean. Um, so I have five, six different uh, clover types as cover crops in different places in the garden. I use different ones in different places um, to create a nice mosaic. Um, I have a lupin in the fields, um, a little bit of volunteer alfalfa in one of my other fields. And so there's lots of um, orientations. There's in Washington State alone, there's like 600 native um, bee and wasp species. Um, what was the benefit of the things that didn't do that? Um, the floral arrangement, it, well, the type of nectar is the type of things that they hymenopter really like. However, you also need a protein source, umbels. Right. So uh, that's the right. umbel diet, umbels. So that's uh, anything yeah, that right. has the the yeah. umbrella top, so carrot, um, lomatium, um, dill, yeah, dill um, cilantro, all yarrow. those guys, yarrows, um, anything in that family provides the, the pollen for protein. Yarrow is actually the acid. Is it? Yeah. Uh, it is, I like that too. Um, so um, it's <coughs> basically I'm laying out the dinner table for the guys that I want to come in. So kind of the whole big permaculture picture. You're going to Absolutely. plant these flowers further away right. to draw them away. I have, I have things under the orchard trees. I have different things over by the strawberry patch. And so biodiversity. So here's the thing. Mints, they love mints. Yes, they do. Um, like cattle. So, so the first thing is um, walk and observe. And you know who you have, who you want to be hanging out in your field. It was like the Wisconsin apple orchard. Fill the niche. Um, so I have another story about. Um, I used to work for a uh, organic farm supply place in Wenatchee after I left the research facility, and um, there was a guy that wanted to grow 3,000 acres of potatoes out in the Columbia Basin, and he was going to make a million bucks selling organic french fries to the Japanese. <laughs> yeah. and, and so I suggested something that we had put together, we called it Bug and Breakfast Blend. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, a variety of both cultivated and wild plants. And I suggested that he plant a row of that instead of potatoes about every 200 feet. Um, and uh, I went out one time because he called him. I got these bugs and I have no idea what they are. And so I don't know what to do about it. And so we went out and I was walking crosswise across the field over the rows. And I could tell, even before I could see the row of bug and breakfast, just the things flying in the air. And I also had my, you know, Peterson's insect guide. And so we're sitting there, I'm trying to key it out. It's a psyllid. <laughs> it's going for a psyllid related to aphids, parasilla, oh, it's a soft-bodied insect, not a pest for potatoes. No, it was tiny. Is there so much problem the potatoes? Um, there's a lot of problems with zebra chip in the potatoes. Um, say that again? There's a, I'm pretty sure it's is a there one? that's the vector for a zebra chip, which is a virus in potatoes. But I've never even heard of that. That's a whole other like, like what's attracting them. Is it something in the potato, you know, or in the yeah. food that can help identify right. problems with the crop? Right. And what it attracts? You know, it's you funny have because you say so. I have never heard of that. But lately, I've been looking at bugs and just describing them on, in Google the description. And yes. then I can usually come up with some pictures right. that I can pick out the bug and then it tells me about it. Because I like. Just yeah. in this new world, because I didn't know what a June bug. And oh, they're, they're outside lovely. my house, like this huge. And yeah, you know, I mean, you start to wonder if they're going to bite you or your grandchild, and so, right, you know, right. all of these things. And like, they're big, and they oh, buzz, really and yeah, they do bite too. Huh? Do bugs? Bite. 
fascinating. Anyway, he, he's, a, he's still worried. It's like, so what do we do about it? And I said, um, nothing. <laughs> and he's like going, okay. And he'd actually bought a warehouse of organic pesticide mm -hmm. preparing to do that. And actually, of course, he was concerned about Colorado potato beetle. <laughs> he also had um, circle irrigation. And so he was concerned about, uh, you know, you know potato blight. And so... <laughs> so, so he'd been spraying copper in the water. And what we observed together over the course of the season, it's not labeled as an insecticide, but the potato beetle didn't want to eat as much, so feeding was less. Larval or egg masses were smaller. Larva kit hatched out weak and puny. He never sprayed. He never sprayed. He he estimates that he lost maybe five percent of his crop to to potato beetle um, feeding, but um, not enough to justify the cost of the pesticide. Wow. Yeah. So well, that's what the Indian farmers all know. Yeah, because it doesn't do any good to do it. It makes everything work. Well, it starts a treadmill. Mm -hmm. So, and so all your indigenous plants on the outside die, but other people are eating. <laughs> yes. I'm going to backtrack here. So we talked about predators. Um, I have some of these guys in there, you know, like that, and, and nobody wants to harvest. Oh, yes. What is it called? Um, well, yeah. I also have a, and I haven't identified it, it's it's yellow and it has a triangular body yeah. and they also get huge. Yeah. And um, one is it huh? There's one called cat face that's got a triangular. Yeah, yeah but that's a, not an orb weed. You're talking about an orb These, weed. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, so I have it's more the abdomen that one that like spins that. that type of web. So that's a ladybug? <laughs> yeah, that's a ladybug. That's so another that's ladybug. Right Green lace wing. Green mm -hmm. okay. mantis. Yeah. yeah. And, and those are the ones that, that eat. They prey on what? what Lots of things. Most, of, most um, predators that you'll want to attract are generalists because you have a diverse garden. It's not going to be, you know, this bug, this, you know, predator, like it wasn't this bug, this spray. You want something that is generalized because as soon as my, um, my lacewing and my ladybugs are done, dealing with the cherry aphid, then they jump over to the plums, and oh, then I've got something over here, rosy apple aphid over here. And so they move around over the course of the season, and they don't just eat one thing. Although there are some that are more specific, like this guy here, knapweed. Um, I'm mainly dealing with diffuse and not a lot of it. Lorinus minutus, knapweed seed weevil. So that is an insect that is um, directly tied to the life cycle. And so um, uh, WSU was actually giving people <coughs> colonies of seed weevils. At first they were charging them and they just wanted them out. And so they've been giving them away for free for years now. They still do it? Yeah. They still do it. Yeah. So instead of using <coughs> insecticides, just yep. get some of those guys and they take care they, of them. Um, the adults, you can see them crawling up as soon as it has a seed stalk. They lay eggs in the seed head. The larva burrow it out, so use the seed head to protect the pupa over the winter, huh. and then the adults hatch out in the spring as soon as there's a place to lay eggs. And it still lets the bees pollinate. Yes. So you can still get Yeah, the because benefit. it's not, yeah. But it, it takes a while to decimate the population, right? Yes. Yeah. So they gave me a colony of 100. And I marked the, the plant that I put them on and went back in October uh, to see, you know, breaking open the <coughs> to see what had colonized that first year and maybe six feet. It's like, oh God, this is going to take forever. Because it was kind of around six acres of land. Uh -huh. Next year was more like 25 feet. Oh, the year after that. It was like, ooh, 125 oh, wow. feet, 150 in some directions. And then the next year they were everywhere. They were just everywhere. They usually take so about four years for a beneficial release to yeah. control the population. Yep. And the impression I get about that is that it's 
more about, like, it's not going to get rid of FNAFLI, but it's more mm -hmm. about reducing its invasiveness Correct. because it's got a natural predator then. So it will Correct. persist at low levels and, and still those insects. So I still do hand pulling after they've hatched out. <laughs> so I'm pulling old ones because they'll come back as a rosette the following year. Mm -hmm. And if root. it's already, yeah. And so I, I make sure I get the root. Although for mm -hmm. Russian napweed, there's also a root weevil as well. Yeah, like so the else. tougher types of napweed take multiple guys to control. And there is a whole body of research. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Really? Where do we get those? <laughs> <laughs> um, can so I have, have somebody be a runner for me? I don't know. Where would you like to uh, My booth with the green canopy. Okay. Okay. I have that Nigerian basket. Okay. I have to bring my resource material. There is a, 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 a compilation of uh, suppliers of beneficial insects in North America. Mm. You can print it down off the web. It's a little old. It's a 1997 version was the last one they printed out that's available for download. But um, a lot of those folks are still in business um, and doing good work. But there is a whole bunch specifically for weeds, not just other insects. <laughs> Um, and then, yes. If you're in Washington State, we have a biological control specialist. She's out of Seattle, but she works statewide. Her name's Jennifer Stephan, or Stephan. And she'll literally help set you up with beneficials to release. I mean, there's beneficials for skeleton weed and map weed and um, bind weed and a lot of the real common weed pests that we have. section that we haven't talked about yet are pathogens. Mm -hmm. And so there are good viruses. Um, Nosema locuste uh, for uh, grasshopper um, is a mycoplasm and actually it uh, is live. And so they um, put it on bran flakes and spray it with a little bit of molasses to kind of sweeten the deal. And you just are out there with a shaker can I usually go to the edge of the, the garden because uh, they'll be out in the dry stuff and then they'll want to hop in the garden and then go back. And um, so um, it so is live in there. Absolutely, you can definitely take it Absolutely. And it's, because it stays live, it passes through the egg to the next generation. Um, even if it doesn't out and out kill them, it will slow them down and give them a stomach ache. And then other uh, down to a dull roar. See, that's the thing. It, you're not going for eradication or elimination. Just wow. tipping the scales. Yeah. So it's they, like we have grasshoppers out there in the tent area. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, grasshoppers really aren't that big. It's yeah, really I've like seen them really awful. Yeah. But um, that tells me that something else is out of balance. Yeah. You know. So yeah. um, like so this whole idea is trying Dr. to. George. Um, achieve this dynamic equilibrium. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's Things will thing. always change over Because time. you don't want to decimate them. Is there any issue with that in really the uh, interacting or engaging with the one that affects the bees? Because mm -hmm. there's that's a nice. no scene that affects the bees. Uh, no, it's a, that's a different species. No. Yeah, because um, I worked with some beekeepers in Washington that were still going back to California. And so what I find, my gals are wild. Mm -hmm. the I had um, uh, I had commercial bee strains for a while, and then after the fires, um, they burned them out of their hollows in the forest, and literally they just arrived on my fence post at the garden. So that was another thing that came out of the forest, and I just mm -hmm. put a box underneath and kind of you yeah. know brimmed them in and put the lid on, and they called it home. Although I lost one. Um, just about a month ago, it says, "No, no, we found a spot back in the forest. We're out here." Yeah. So <laughs> they get there faster than the the what do they call it? The bees that go out to forage for a new spot. If they the find a, yeah. the, if they find a place before you get them taken care of, they'll just take the swarm. Yeah. yeah. They just tell them, yeah. "We found the spot. This is all out here." Yeah. But it was good to have them. They were different. They were different than commercial strains. Behaviors were different. Mm -hmm. Sounds were different. Oh, Feeding habits were different. So, 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 so,
So with that nursema, are there any issues with um, grasshopper predators like kestrels or anything like that? Um, I don't think so. I have barn swallows um, that um, just um, especially early in the season, those are the ones that really come in as the populations start to build. They're just swooping back and forth over the garden, having a feast. Did you mention, or is this even true, that uh, blister beetles um, eat grasshopper eggs? I don't know. Blister beetle larvae, grasshopper larvae, and grab egg. Yeah, I've never encountered blister, blister, blister beetles in my garden. So that would be the thing if you have them. Okay. Uh, yeah. well, well, observations. So this is this is that publication, and I'll leave it here. Pretty much a bits. Um, yes. Do you have any idea why grasshoppers seem to prefer the dry stuff? They Stick to the dry stuff and usually leave the greener stuff alone until. They eat a little bit of everything at my house. They'll eat both green and dry. Yeah, they're right. But they still eat the That's what they grass. need to lay their eggs. They have to. Yeah. The grasshopper needs a hard, firm, dry place to lay the eggs. Or maybe they just yeah. scatter yeah. more in the dry yeah. area so you notice them more. I don't know. Yeah, that might be that you can see better. So mowing, mowing your, mowing the grass and let the sun come down and beat and warm up the ground, yeah. you'll get more grass on. <laughs> if you've got yeah. a lot of high grass and everything, there's dew and moisture in there. They can't, they're, they can't lay their eggs in there and the eggs won't hatch. It has to be a dry, hard place. That's why on the farms. They can't do anything in the fields. They got they lay on the outside pastures around there where the cattle have eaten it way down, mm -hmm. and then then they come into the the fields. Yeah, you can see that right out here. The irrigated fields, and the dry fields, yeah. You can see the hoppers on one of the dry fields. <laughs> so I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about um, that whole. How do you get a climax community? How do you, you know, it's not just, oh, this is different than that, like, why is it different, how is it different? How do they arrive in the first place? So I always use the um, analogy of a new volcanic island in the middle of the Pacific. Nothing but rock. What shows up first? Well, probably something to help create soil, um, lichen, um, breaking down the rock. Mm -hmm. Oh, then we have little plants, and then bigger plants, oh, woodier ones, you know, ones with deeper root systems. Oh, then insects to come in, you know, probably aphid. It's probably aphid that shows up first. They show up first everywhere. And, and then the thing that eats aphid. Because you, know, you can invite somebody to dinner and not put something on the table. So, there are stages of a community, and so initially um, you won't see them. Um, no, it's not the page I want. It's not the page. Plenty of elbow room, lots of space to spread out, don't really have to worry about much. And then more things show up and start bumping into each other. And populations of different things will start to interact. And maybe it's good for them, maybe they have symbiotic relationships, and maybe they don't. Maybe they start competing for space, for nutrients, for habitat. And then, um, things start to sort themselves out. And so you'll see changes. Um, this is even more of that. This decided to move over to this side of the island. And then at some point, like the Galapagos, they will start developing unique adaptations for their particular place and are either better adapted to living there or die off. And so, in a climax community, they will have gone through all of that and 
things will still change over time, but it is uh, increased diversity. And that is always the thing I look for when I look at an ecosystem is how many things live here? Is there more room for more to come in? Um, and that's essentially what plowing or spraying does, is it takes you back to square one. And you have to go through all those steps again. So that's why those practices are counterproductive, is that it's about nature wanting to come back to climax community and that dynamic equilibrium. <coughs> so everything you can do to mimic in your actions the climax community and not, you know, well, I'm going to break out the lower 40. And it's like, maybe, maybe not. You want to think about that long and hard before you do it because there are consequences. Um, you know, I've watched a PBS special recently on this diversity thing, and apparently Darwin was really into orchids, which I didn't know. I thought he was more into this whole thing about the species thing, but orchids were his specialty, and he found it when they started to specialize, and it was all about sex, because they needed to get pollinated. Oh, right. And they fool the bees and all the other things that make things so that it looks like what the bee needs, and the bee gets in there and it has to go through a special hole even to get out of the thing. And so we have a whole bunch of sexual things going on mm -hmm. that we really have to study in order to see what's happening with the plants, because that's their whole game, is to get propagation going and get diversity in the pollination, because right. that's, that's the whole deal. This is really what makes us all go, is right. the diversity. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> to continue on hand. Yes. <laughs> there, are, there were pictures I saw of um, uh, flower petals that had um, shot into the ultraviolet range, mm -hmm. and there were like targets. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. It was like, here you go, and um, that we don't see. Well, and they look sometimes just like an anatomy of a bee, or yes. a, you know, I mean, or, or a fly, or something. Lots of mimicry. Yes, yeah, but it's fooling the real thing. But it's they have they even develop some kind of hormones that attract certain bees. The, the flower does, yeah. and it's not indigenous. They have done this, right? A fool's game. <laughs> no, just it's what works. Are so Good recruiters. <laughs> Good recruiters. It's really amazing. Plants are so wise. It's, they're just incredible. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of um, basic survival strategies. So I always I love to use aphid as um, <laughs> as an example. They're so easy. Um, <coughs> and fodder. Um, they're effective colonizers. Um, they tend to be small, highly dispersible, large number of progeny. What did I hear? Lobsters have hundreds of thousands of eggs that they just release into the water. It's like, yeah. oh, the mackerel. Um, but After they're, they're fertilized. Right. Um, short life cycle, low survival rate, not very competitive. Because there's so many of them, they're expendable. Turtles. Yes. Okay. And so the R and K, that was what's in the genetics speak. Um, I don't know where they came up with those letters, but there you go. Um, so K strategists, those are your predators. Lady Bug, Lace Wing, tend to be higher on the food chain, so they'll tend to eat the other guys. Um, they colonize later to ensure that there's already an adequate food source available. Lower number of prodigy, longer life cycle, highly competitive, and better survival. So that's also humans. Raptors, um, all those guys. 